Chris Bigfoot from Los Angeles, USA, conducts an over-the-phone interview with Jesus. This interview was recorded on the 14th of October, 2012. Hello, AJ speaking. Hello, AJ. It's Chris. How are you? G'day, Chris. How are you doing? Good. Can you just hold the line and we'll start in about 30 seconds? Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. Starting in 30. And good evening, Los Angeles. We have AJ Miller here who lives on 600 acres of donated land in a remote part of Australia. And he claims he is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. AJ, mainstream society first became aware of you with the broadcast of Sunday Night, which is the Australian, which is the Australian equivalent of 60 Minutes. What, what did you think of that broadcast? Well, firstly, uh, your opening introduce, introduction was an indication of uh, that other people listen to broadcasts that are not actually true. I, I don't actually live on 600 acres of donated land. Um, I live in 40 acres of my own land. <laughs> And myself and Mary live in a home, just a normal home here in Australia. So, um, but but there is the impression given by by you know the media that certain things are true when they are not. Okay, a, a lot of Americans who have come upon you um, have done so because of that broadcast of Sunday night. Yeah. Um, Sorry, are you denying that a lot of that is was in, in fact factual, or was a lot of it false? Um, pretty much most of it was false. I've written a response that I've placed on my website, and, and that those responses indicate what was false. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was false, and and the people who were interviewing me, who finished up presenting the show, knew that it was false when they presented it as well. If you could go into specifics, what what exactly? Was it about that broadcast that uh, that bothered you or that you felt was a, a defamation of character, if you will? Um, yeah, I don't think anything bothers me, even when I'm lied about. So that it doesn't really bother me. It just uh, I just feel that uh, it's interesting how people want to present things that are false. That um, and uh, and I feel that uh, the majority of times there's there's underlying reasons for people presenting false things. But um, with regard to the broadcast, um, well. Well, almost everything that was presented in it was false in some way. And uh, what about the things that you directly said, though? Are, are you denying? Are you saying that they were altered somehow? Or um, a lot of the things that I've directly said that were quoted in the broadcast were quoted out of context. And and so, unfortunately, with skillful editing, any media outlet can quote something out of context and and then obviously make it seem like I'm saying something that I'm not. And uh, I feel that's the problem with most of the TV media, is it appears that a lot of the times it's heavily edited. And, uh, and unfortunately, um, as a result of that, it is quite often misleading or, uh, and completely, in some cases, false. Yeah. Well, I, I know that the media has uh, often treated you with a degree of disdain. And, uh, <laughs> yes. Because, because the, the claim that you're making is, is a huge claim, and obviously it's going to catch the attention of uh, the entire planet, really. Uh, there are two billion Christians on the planet, mm -hmm. as well as those people who are, who are not Christian. Um, but you coming on here today, I've determined that I want to give you a fair chance to say what you have to say and to defend yourself. I watched uh, over 30 hours of, of your lectures, and I, I want you to have that opportunity today. Um, and I promised you in advance of, uh, of us going on air that I would not edit or distort anything. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's great, Chris. That's one of, the, one of the reasons why I agreed to the interview. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. uh, AJ, do you prefer AJ or Jesus? It doesn't worry me, Chris, what people call me. Um, most people are pretty uncomfortable with Jesus, of course. So most people call me AJ. But are you uncomfortable with Jesus? No, not at all. Uh, I, uh, I don't have any as much investment in my uh, own identity as what other people sort of have as an investment in my identity. Um, Fair enough. I, I just feel like I am who I am, and, and so... And that, that, that's all I can say about it, really.
Um, Fair enough. Yeah. Let's talk about your life a little bit. You, sure. Uh, if, if there's any facts here that are incorrect, feel free to uh, interrupt me. You have two sons who are in their 20s. Yes. Uh, you were married to a, a woman who suffered from debilitating depression for 13 years. Yes. And she eventually left you and your two sons. And um, I eventually left her, but yes. Yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> And you went through a time where your sons no longer wanted any contact with you. Why was that? Was that in, because of the claim that you were Jesus or was it for other reasons? No, I, uh, this was way before I claimed that I was Jesus. Um, and mostly it was because of the religious pressure that they were under. We, we uh, had shared custody of our children and because of the religious pressure that they were under, they decided they didn't want to see me for a time. That, that lasted for about 18 months uh, or just a bit under. 18 months and then they both decided to come and live with me actually after that so so it, after after that had happened they decided both of them to at different times to come and live with me and so after that period of time they lived with me in my home Mm. And what do they think of, of your claim that you're Jesus? Because they were raised as Jehovah's Witnesses, correct? They were, yes. Um, no, they both uh, they don't both don't have any trouble with my claim that I'm Jesus. My older son uh, believes it pretty pretty strongly, and my younger son is more undecided. But they both uh, treat me the same as they've always treated me. We have a great relationship, so. Mm. What about your parents? I know, I know that your mother had uh, had a lot of misgivings and tried to admit you, or she did admit you into a psychiatric facility for a time. Is she now on board with you, or is she still having issues? Yeah, she didn't admit me to a psychiatric uh, facility. She she discussed the issue with a psychiatrist who tried to convince her to do so. Um, but but after I was assessed, uh, they they realised that uh, there was no reason to to commit me for any purpose. Um, my mum, my mum now is is very much more interested in in the divine truth that I teach than she was back then. My father is still quite resistive to it. He, he's still a Jehovah's Witness, and uh, and of course, from from his perspective, I, I'm an apostate to their faith. And AJ, tell me, what what is the reason for? Because I, from what I saw, there there was a 600 acre development that you were trying to to um, bring forth for your for your people. Is that not true? Is it no, no, it's not true. Um, there, we, what we do, myself and Mary, is we we, we live on a home uh, on a property, a 40 acre property that I purchased around eight years ago with my own funds, and uh, we live alone. We don't have any compound or any you know cult that we lead or anything like that. We, we all we do is free seminars um, with with people, anybody who wants to listen. We don't uh, guide people and tell them what to do with their life. We don't uh, control them in any way. We just we just teach. Well, I'm quite firm about the what I believe is the truth, and so I teach what I believe is the truth, and um, and that's all we do. The, there are people who own properties um, that who who live near us and also a long way away from us who want to practice the principles we teach and they have asked us to give them advice um, about what to do on their properties which would bring them into more harmony with love and while they want that advice myself and Mary give it as soon as they don't want that advice then we don't give it anymore so it's quite quite simple we don't own the properties we have no uh, financial investment in the properties we do donate to their properties uh, sometimes um, particularly our time and effort to to help them with different projects that they've got going on but uh, myself and Mary don't have any financial or other interest in the properties themselves and we're certainly not owners of them. Just to, just so I don't look bad, I, I saw from my sources on a, one of your broadcasts where you were where you were featured and you were standing in a, a remote field and you were speaking with your own words about 600 acres that were going to be connected and yes, um, yeah. So that's one of the properties that uh, some of our friends own. Uh, we don't personally own it. All we do is advise people what to do with it. In, initially, they wanted to donate it to us, and so probably the recording that you heard might have 
indicated that, but uh, but myself and Mary refused to, to have properties donated to us um, because we we feel that we're having enough trouble maintaining our own property of 40 acres, let alone um, having responsibility for properties all around the world for for different purposes. We feel the people who own the properties are the best people to determine what happens to them, and so all we do is give them advice when when they want that advice. Okay, mm. and you, you've mentioned in, in a lot of your lectures and teachings that there are going to be certain apocalyptic events that are going to occur throughout the world, and is, is the property that you have in Australia, is that intended to be a sort of safe haven for when this occurs? No, um, uh, the property that I own, uh, where myself and Mary live, I, I, I purchased, uh, like I said, about eight or seven or eight years ago, and I purchased it primarily so that myself and Mary could have some privacy and uh, and enjoy each other's company um, rather than having lots and lots of people visit all the time. As it turned out, people decided to move near us, um, uh, which which. For initially, uh, for myself and Mary, we were we were a bit concerned about that because that would take away some of our privacy. We believed, but at the moment, uh, everyone's quite respectful of our time and privacy, so so it's working quite well. But their decision to move out to the location was their choice and decision. We haven't influenced them in any way, and and we don't believe that there are a limited amount of what I'd call safe havens on on the planet. I feel the majority of the planet will survive any coming possible changes that occur and so I don't have a sort of we don't have teachings of an apocalypse or an Armageddon or any of those kind of things. You have, uh, you have said that it seems like uh, with all due respect it seems like you're backpedaling a little bit so I've, I've watched hours and hours and hours and hours of your lectures yep. um, and it, it seems that you're sort of uh, either backpedaling or trying to uh, make it a little more bland than, than what you're actually saying on the... On yeah, no, I do, I do currently believe that there will be quite significant changes on the planet over the coming years, um, mostly because of how mankind is treating the planet. And uh, and I do believe there are certainly more safe places that are more safe than other places on the planet, but um, but it's not a very uh, you know I think in in total I've probably talked about it, ten or fifteen hours of seven hundred hours of presentations, uh, so it's not a very high priority for us to talk about. It's usually what the media focuses on rather than excuse me. <coughs> rather than what we actually talk about. So, um, and I only usually talk about it in response to people's questions um, about the subject. As you probably know, there's a lot of people on the planet who do believe that the coming, there are coming changes that are going to occur. And, and so what I try to do is just answer their question as best as I am able. I don't have any firm but you, you personal to have, but, but you claim to have divine knowledge of what's going to happen because... No, I don't. I'm sorry, I can't agree with that. I've never claimed that, um, in fact, I've prefaced every single discussion I've had with people about this subject with... Um, as the son of God who is claiming to be the, the saviour of humanity. Would... I'm not claiming to be the saviour of humanity. Um, well, the son of God. See, can, I, can I put to you, Chris, that a lot of the media's conception of what I'm claiming is, is, really, is really based upon my claim that I'm Jesus. And then they make a lot of presumptions about my claim that I'm Jesus. No, and it has nothing to do with the media because I, I am a Christian and yeah. I worship Christ my whole life. So yeah. if somebody claims that they are the second coming of Christ, yeah. they are the son of God and they have divine knowledge because they are half God and half man. That, see, I can't agree with that. that. That is your Christian teachings and I understand that you have those. Um, oh, it's not what I'm claiming though. So, but it, but you're claiming to be Jesus of Nazareth from yes, the Bible. Yes, but I don't believe the Bible is the is the Word of God. Nor do I believe that it had the correct. Um, it, it states the correct things about my life in the first century. Okay, so what, what is the Bible then? It's not the Word of God. Well, the Bible is a collection of writings from people who who were sometimes inspired and sometimes had personal opinions. And that collection of writings were amalgamated in, in about just after 300 AD um, by Constantine, who, by the way, was not a Christian. 
and and that collection of, of writings was then uh, associated to be the sacred scriptures of many of the Christians, firstly of the Catholic faith. But that that collection of writings were written many many years after I existed on on the earth in the first century, and therefore contains many distortions. Okay, uh, let's just move on, AJ. Just yep. to, I wanted to tell our, our listeners um, my first experience with with Jesus, and this is what really your story really caught my eye. Um, I learned about Jesus when I was a nine year old. My family was homeless at the time. We were living at a Salvation Army shelter, which is a, a it's a shelter for homeless people and for drug addicts, etc., on the streets of Southern California. Yep. And uh, there were very holy people there doing the work of Christ and who worshipped Christ. If you, you know, you would understand if you're saying that you are Christ. And the people in that homeless shelter were doing much the same work that Christ did in the first century in the Bible. Um, and they worked anonymously uh, to homeless AIDS patients, making meals for 200 drug addicts, disabled people with no health care, mentally ill people with no medication and no hope. Mm-hmm. Um, does your story coincide with that Christ that was introduced to me from the Bible and on the streets of uh, southern Los Angeles? Well, uh, I suppose you could say that the Bible record of my life contains some truth and some and some falsities. Um, so, but, but in terms of the underlying spirit, which is a spirit and the things that I taught about in the first century, I taught about love primarily, love between people, but also love the, the love of God entering a person. And, and I feel that many people, many Christians have actually received divine love from God. I don't agree with them working Worshipping me, um, I, I have never been a part of God, nor have I ever been God, nor have I. I am just a son of God, just as you are a son of God, and just as any woman is a daughter of God. Um, we we are all potentially uh, able to receive this divine love from God, and many many Christians have done so. But you're claiming to be Jesus, which is very di- because Christ lives in all of us. The Bible teaches that, but but you're not claiming that Christ merely lives within you. you you're claiming you are Christ, correct? No, I'm claiming that I'm Jesus. There's a misunderstanding, I believe, in the Christian faith about what is Christ. Christ is when a person uh, receives divine love to the point of at one with God, which I did do in the first century. But that is a process that a person must go through, and and I believe that many Christians have begun that process of receiving divine love and once once people become at one with God and there are many people in the spirit world who have become at one with God in this process they have all become Christed so so Christed is this process that you go through so any normal person can go through this process to become at one with God Absolutely. Mm. So, so you're saying that you have Christ within you, but you're not Jesus. That's correct. I, I'm saying, no, no, I'm saying that I am Jesus, but I do not have Christ within me at this point because I'm not yet at one with God again. Once I become at one with God again, then I will have Christ within me, just as when you become at one with God, you will be able to have Christ within you. But I won't claim to be Jesus Christ. No, because I am the person Jesus, whereas you are the person Chris. We are no different from each other. We have the same, often very similar desires and goals and so forth. And and the reality is we are different personalities. And the way people identified me in the first century was they called me the name Yeshua. And and that's my name. But, but that doesn't mean that I am any different to you. So I'm not teaching that I'm any different to the average person on the planet. Okay, what, what, what do you think, uh, AJ, about, um, I mean, you talked about it in one of your lectures about false prophets, because there are a lot of false prophets on the earth, and you're, you're aware of this. Um, what do you think of Wayne Bent, uh, also known as Michael Trabass? Are you familiar with him? No. No. Um, he's he's from New Mexico. He's in his sixties. In his sixties, right. um, he claims to be the Messiah. He claims to be Jesus. Yep. Um, and 
he said that God commanded him to sleep with a series of underage girls, uh, to split families up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Uh, he went to jail in 2008. Yeah. Um, there's also the thousands of, of delusional schizophrenics. Uh, I agree. <laughs> claim, claim that they are Jesus Christ. Yeah. And there's also there's also a gentleman in Russia named Sergei Charov. Yes, I've heard of him. Yeah. In 1989, he uh, he left the police force in Russia, and uh, he claimed that he was the son of God, and now he has a, a commune isolated in the Siberian mountains. So, mm. with with all of these false prophets, how do you differentiate yourself from them, AJ? Well, only by so, and, and I'm being fair here for those people who who might be interested in following you. Of course, um, I, for a start, I don't encourage people to follow me. I just encourage people to listen to the teachings and make their own mind up about you know what's being taught. But secondly, um, I feel that all of these particular people that you have mentioned, by their fruits, as I said in the first century, you will recognise them. So in the long run, what, what, what I actually do will be, will be very different to what these people have done or are currently doing. What that you plan to do? Sorry? Sorry, I didn't get that, Chris. Uh, what is it that you plan to do? You said, what I will actually do. Well, uh, all, I, all I wish to do is to teach what I believe is the divine truth. I act in a very moral and ethical way with, in all of my dealings with people. Um, I'm loving in, my, in, all, in all of my dealings with people. I don't, uh, I don't treat people badly. And, uh, and I don't uh, take any advantage over people. And I certainly don't sleep with underage women. Or I, don't, I only sleep with one woman and have done, you know, I'm a monogamous person. Um, and I don't encourage pe people sexual promiscuity or any of these other things that other these other so-called people that, that claim to be me actually do do. And like I said, by what I do, you you will see whether you know I'm a reasonable person or not. Um, you know, I, I look at many of the people who are claiming to be Jesus on the planet, and many of the things I would have to agree that they do are, are completely unreasonable and also quite immoral in many cases. Um, and so I feel some compassion for them that they have uh, not developed their love enough to become a moral person or an ethical person, but uh, that's not the person who I am. So just because there are like thousands of people who claim to be Jesus, my suggestion to people is, you know, if you're investigating it, investigate each one individually rather than just putting right across the board that every one of them is going to act in a certain manner um, just because they claim to be Jesus. Uh, just about every one of the media's attacks of myself has been based upon other people rather than my own conduct. Well, I'm, I, you know, I'm not sure about that. I think perhaps they haven't given you a fair shake because naturally, if you're, you're going to claim, if you're going to claim to be Jesus Christ, you yep. have to kind of you have to kind of show the goods at least if you're going to go public with that. Yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that either. I don't think I have anything to prove. I, I don't think I need to prove anything. I think in time, my teachings and 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 my own life will prove whether I'm telling the truth or not. What does that mean, though? That's very cryptic. Well, I, I don't say cryptic things. I, I, I thought I was quite specific. My own life, what I do in my own life and my own teachings will prove who I am in the end. Um, and so I can't, you know, I can't suggest anything further. In the first century, I claimed I was the Messiah, you know, when I was 31 years of age. Um, but I went through a process, you know, of becoming at one with God. That's why there is no record of me you know, doing things that I did after 31 years of age before that time. And, and this is it's the same process I'm going through now. And this is the process that uh, I want to show people what to do. That's the main reason why, um, why we've come, is, is to show people how to become at one with God from a condition of sin. And, and what are you doing to, to show people how to become one with God? And I, I just want to say that um, I know a lot of the media never has asked you directly, mm -hmm. has never given you the chance to say uh, what kind of miracles you do perform on a daily basis. If we look at uh, Matthew 9 in the Bible, uh, you, you 
healed a paralyzed man in the Gospel of Mark, mm-hmm. you healed the blind. Uh, Luke 17, you healed 10 lepers, mm-hmm. and you even raised a widow's son. And I, w- I want to ask you, what kind of miracles are you performing now? And, and just, be, be, just to preface that, Jesus, I, I remember very clearly in 1986, my next door neighbor, she was also nine years old, and she had neuroblastoma, and she was dying. Mm-hmm. And I remember her father always said, she's going to get better. She's going to get better because Christ will save her. Mm-hmm. You know, they were they were Christians. And and when she passed away, I remember looking out at the father from, you know, my bedroom window on the second floor, and he was writhing in the snow in his backyard, screaming like he'd been shot. Um, do you remember that? AJ, do you remember him praying to you? Well, the problem is that most people who pray to me are really not... Uh, I, don't, I don't receive a lot of those prayers because because they really are praying to God. And no, 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 he's praying to Jesus Christ. Yeah, but they, they interpret inside of their emotional state that Jesus Christ is God. And, and, and so God actually receives those prayers. I don't receive them. Well, Jesus is the Son of God. You, we can pray directly to you. Know that we can pray directly to you. No, I don't agree with that at all. Um, I don't agree with anybody praying to me directly. But why not? It's not a question of it. because I'm just a man like you are, Chris. I have the same. I have limitations as well, and I always have had. Even in the first century, I had limitations. Yeah, can I go back to also answering your first statements, which were about you know the different things that miracles that I performed in the first century, the miracles. The miracles that I performed in the first century were the result of me becoming at one with God. Once I became at one with God, then I could perform miracles. Once I become at one with God in this life, I can perform miracles, but it's, and it's not me performing them. In the first century, it wasn't me performing them. It was God working through me. I had become at one with God, so I had got to the condition where I was able to perform miracles. That's why there is no record in the Bible of me performing miracles before that time. And you could create more miracles in his 20s, primarily, and in his early 30s. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that I began performing miracles when I was in my 30s. Right, well, you're crucified by it at the age of 33. That's correct. So it was only three and a half years that I actually performed miracles um, in the first century. And, and before then, I never performed any miracles in the first century. And the reason why was because I was not at one with God yet, and I had to become at one with God in order to get into the state of performing miracles. And it's exactly the same now. I need to become at one with God again through this same process that I, that I engaged in the first century. And then once I become at one with God, then God will choose to do what God do, does through me if God chooses. And that is completely independent of, of my own will in the sense that... Well, I'm a little, I have to confess, I'm a little disappointed because I, <laughs> you're, saying, you're saying that any miracles or any, any things that you're going to perform are going to happen uh, down the road when you become one with God. Right now, you're just an ordinary bloke. That's correct. Oh, how old are you now? I am now, now I'm 49. 49, well, you don't have much time. Well, I started engaging this process about eight years ago or nine years ago, and in the first century it took me around 13 years to become at once with God once I engaged that process. I engaged that process in the first century when I was around 18 years of age, and, and I became one with God when I was in my 31st year. So, so it took me around 13 years in the first century to become at one with God, and I, I don't expect that it will take me any shorter period of time this time. So... I may be 55 before I become a one with God. Right, okay. <laughs> um, we move on, AJ? Sure, sure. Um, psychodrama, because I, I, really, I saw that you use a lot of psychodrama in your lectures. Are you, are you familiar with that term? No, not really. A psychodrama is where someone stands in front of a group and uh, with with a patient or client, and it's a therapeutic technique, and the patient relieves, relives uh, some pain from their childhood, and they, they sort right. of... Uh, yeah, I've only done that on actual four occasions, to my memory, four different seminars. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I've, I've presented 260 seminars, so... 
Right. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you also you frequently lecture with uh, you use the whiteboard magic markers in front of the audience. Yeah, you know, I just like the whiteboard because it, it's in, you know personally engaging. I feel absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's sort of a form of therapy for for those who are watching, and, and you frequently ask questions or people ask questions of you about you know family of origin issues, sexual abuse, marital problems, and I notice there's a lot of talk about addictions. Why that why that focus, AJ? Um, well, firstly, uh, firstly, uh, like I said, I've only done probably at the most 16 hours of presentations out of out of 700 hours in that uh, with with engaging people up the front with me. Secondly, um, oftentimes people ask me a lot of questions um, during the presentation of a certain subject, and so of course I try to give them personal examples in their own life of of how those those particular things are affected by the divine truth. So, so my purpose is to basically just engage the person personally. If a person comes comes voluntarily to a presentation, I do. And remember, all of the presentations are free, so any person can come. And then usually I'm asked questions on specific subjects, and of course I try to give people direct answers about their own life. Because so. they're 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 treating you as an authority on the subject obviously uh, not necessarily a lot of people who have you know most people in fact in the audiences have been very critical of me and were also quite critical of the things that i teach and there is certainly not sorry i know i've never seen that in the many hours i've watched oh well, that's because they don't say it publicly they tell me privately through emails and other things um so yeah i get criticized quite frequently actually Okay, and, and a lot of the people though that, that's on that are on the videos who I see, there a lot of them who worship you basically. No, they don't worship me at all. I don't have anything to do with their day to day life, and I always encourage them to worship God, um, and they certainly don't worship me. But they, they they respect me because I, I spend a lot of my time talk, talking to people for free. Trust me, if you are if, if you are Jesus and these people are coming to see you from all over the world, they're not coming to see some guy. They're coming to see Jesus. No, well, that, see that I can't agree with that. That again is your interpretation based on your beliefs, Chris. That's not how people act in my seminars. When they're at my seminars, they are just themselves. If you were just John John Oak, uh, I don't think they would come all the way. They're coming because you're Jesus. No, a lot of them are coming. Uh, a lot of them, in fact, almost all of them have said to me that if I didn't say I was Jesus, they would have come sooner. Most people. They even don't about you. Well, well, no, I don't think that's true either. But but uh, I feel that a lot of people, and a lot of people have told me this, that they that they uh, that they come despite the fact that I'm claiming to be Jesus, not because of it. And in fact. Most people are highly critical of me claiming to be Jesus, but they enjoy the material I present. And so the majority of the people who come to my seminars still have not resolved whether I'm Jesus or not, and they certainly have not come to worship me. And if anything, most people initially when they come to a seminar come because they wish to attack me in some way. And, and then it turns out that I'm quite a reasonable person and treat them with love. And so after a while, they listen to what I've got to say. Okay, I, I think they should be coming to worship you if, if you are in fact Jesus. No, but see, this is see again. I feel, Chris, you're imposing your Christian beliefs upon me. I don't want the worship of any person. I've never wanted the worship of any person, and I and I do not want the worship of any person. Just because I'm claiming that I'm Jesus, it doesn't mean that I'm wanting to be worshipped. But you're Christian as well, or are you Jewish? Well, in the first century, I was born a Jew, and now I'm, I was born an Australian. Um, and but but uh, to me, how I'm born is immaterial. Um, the the important point is I'm just the same as you. I'm just a man, and just as you wouldn't like to be worshipped by other people, I do not want to be worshipped by other people. I feel that's one of the problems with Christianity is they want to worship me rather than worshiping God, and I am not God. But you're the son of God. Well, just the same as you are the son of God. So there is no difference between myself and yourself in that regard. Well, it, it, it is a little bit different, but, but I, I, can't uh, I can't agree. I can't agree. From God's perspective, you and I are equal. Are you, are you familiar with the book of Revelation and the, the second coming of Jesus Christ? Certainly I am, yeah. Okay, so is, is that 
what you're ascribing yourself to? No, definitely not. You know, in the first century, I never wanted to be a part of killing people or ruling over people and so forth, and, and I am definitely never going to do the same in this life. Um, I never want to be worshipped. I never want to be, uh, uh, you know, re- worshipped in the place of God, and I certainly do not feel God or myself would ever want to kill or destroy another person, even if they are defined as wicked by a group of other people. Okay. Um, are you comfortable to go on, AJ? Sure, Chris. Can I just say something, though? Um, you are imposing a lot of your Christian beliefs upon this discussion rather than... The Christian figure. He's the, main, he's the main figure in Christianity, so that's common sense, AJ. No, I don't believe it's common sense to actually to actually judge somebody through some, some experience based upon some third-party thing. I believe if you're going to ask me questions about my life, then the wiser course of action would be just to do that um, like I do not claim to be God and I do not I do not want to be worshipped and I have never wanted to be worshipped in the last 2,000 years uh, Christians who decide to worship me and pray to me I believe are doing themselves a disservice if they worship God instead and pray to God they would be far better off in their relationship with God but do you understand that what what you're saying is absolute blasphemy to two billion people on this planet for the last two thousand years? Because Christ in the first century knew he was the Son of God and he sacrificed himself for for people and he vowed to return again. So you know, I did not sacrifice myself for any person. I, I understood in the first century that it was impossible for me to save any person individually. Only God's love saves people. I cannot save people. So again, these are just false beliefs that I believe have occurred over th- over thousands of years and been developed, but they don't have any bearing in my life in the first century, nor do they have any bearing in logic. So what, what exactly, and I'm not saying this rhetorically, what exactly makes you Jesus Christ, and what, what exactly ties you in with Christianity or God, other than a notion that you feel like you might be? I don't feel like I might be. I know who I am. Um, So I have a memory of my life in the first century, my life in the spirit world, and my life now. How much do you remember in the first century? Well, I remember almost all of my life in the first century. Um, Remember any Aramaic, which is the language Christ spoke back then? No, there's no need for me to speak Aramaic, and I haven't learned the language again. no matter if there's a need to speak, but if you claim to remember the majority of your life as a, as a defined figure, you, you can remember the language. No, but, I mean, I, and I'm not, AJ, I'm not trying to attack you. I'm just, I'm trying to, to get to the, to the root of this. No, I don't believe you are, Chris. Like, the reason why I don't believe you are is because you do not want to understand how the soul actually functions and how the soul actually works and, and you know, what the process of coming back to the earth is in, it has involved and, and I'm not in the same body that I had uh, 2,000 years ago I don't have the same mind and so therefore I don't have the same language as I had 2,000 years ago if you don't have the same mind how do you remember every detail of the first century which is- well, this is what I'm saying is that if you understood the soul the soul is different to the mind the soul is a record of all of your like life experiences uh, through, through the rest of your life you, once you pass into the spirit world you will have a spirit form, and then as you progress in the spirit world, you will eventually discard also your spirit form and just be the soul that God created you to be. And these are the teachings that I taught in the first century, but they're also the same teachings that I'm teaching now. But most people don't want to question me about those teachings because they have already inside of them a strong definition of what I should be and what they believe I should be is based upon what they've read in the Bible. And as I've mentioned to you, the Bible is a very flawed book in the sense that it contains the writings of people. Now, I know many people on the planet believe that it's inspired of God, but there is direct proof in the Bible itself that it's not inspired of God. And in fact, if anything, the Bible itself attacks God's character and is blasphemous towards God's character. And and this is these are some of the truths that I'd like to teach people on the planet. I don't see any problem with understanding God correctly. I do see a problem when they start saying, 
saying to me that I should be God or that I should that I'm trying to claim that I'm God because I'm not, I've never claimed such things. No, but you okay. We're going in circles here. Mm. Well, let's let's turn to a more positive thing. Sure. Um, the, the law the law of attraction is something that that you obviously believe in strongly. In, in your videos and DVDs, you you use the law of attraction uh, quite a lot. What, what can you tell us about that? Well, the law of attraction is based upon the soul condition of a person, and the soul condition is all of your beliefs and all of your emotions and all of the uh, other factors that make up yourself, all of your memories and all of these things. They, uh, the sum total of that is your soul condition. And God has designed a universe where anything that's unloving in your soul condition will automatically get triggered by events that your soul attracts through the law that God has created called the law of attraction. So it's not uh, an attempt, it's not the same as what other people on earth have taught, you know, regarding if you think the right thing, then that will happen to you. It's about what, what is inside of your emotional state and your feelings and, and your belief systems that, it, that are confronted by this law. Okay, and is it, is, it, uh, is it, just to understand, is it at all related to uh, the film The Secret from Hindu? Not at all. I completely disagree with that with regard to how The Secret Why? portrays the law of attraction. Hmm. Why is that? Because it says that uh, the secret basically implies that you, if you think positive thoughts, that good things will happen to you. And I can't agree with that. Um, your, if your soul is in a state where it has unlovingness in it, then the, the law of attraction says that your soul will attract events to expose that condition to yourself so that you can learn to grow and change. So it's completely different to anything that the secret uh, has presented. I've, I've watched the, the presentation of the secret and I can't agree with almost all of what is said in it. Okay. Mm. Um, you, you know Rick Ross, obviously. Rick Ross or Ross? Ross, R-O-S-S. -S. No, um, I don't know everyone on the planet, no. He, um, he sent me an email because I was trying to get, po I want to get positive information on you to, oh. give, you a, a, to give you a fair shot. Oh, is he a, uh, is he a so-called cult expert or? Yes. Right. Yeah, I think yeah, there was a comment in some Channel 9 interview about that he had made about me or something, yeah. But I don't know him and I've never had spoken to him. I realize on that broadcast you were given a chance to, um, because they, they put his comments in, in post-production, so you weren't given a chance to sort of refute what he had to say, but I, I want to give you that chance now. And he wrote in, in the email he sent to me, he said, in my opinion, Miller is a deeply destructive cult leader. He's a former Jehovah's Witness. It seems to me that at best he's a delusional sick man, but that doesn't excuse all the pain he is causing to so many families. Yeah. At worst, he can be seen as a malicious con man, and the compound he has created is creepy. The only Christian thing about him is that he claims to be Jesus. <laughs> Other than that, he subscribes to his own doctrines and spin on everything, which is anything but historical Christianity. And I, I wanted you to give a chance to kind of uh, refute that. Well, uh, yeah, well, you know, there's so much in it that's false that, uh, that I'd have to basically say that a whole lot of it's false. Like, there are a couple of claims that are true. I was an ex-Jehovah's Witness, so that's true. Um, I don't have a cult. Um, there, are, there are no people who follow me on a daily basis or that I actually meet with on a daily basis. Um, you have, have you received death, th death threats? Only one. What, how, how do you respond to this this kind of uh, criticism and, and this sort of anger that gets conjured up? Well, a lot of times it's conjured up by the media and comments like Rick's comments about me that are totally untrue. I don't have a compound. I don't, you know, people, I don't even give personal advice most of the time to any person, uh, only if they ask. And if they ask, I uh, it's, and I, I know the example that Rick was referring to. He was referring to a woman in the States who at the time I'd never met and never had a personal conversation with. And all she'd done is just watch some videos uh, on YouTube. And she left her husband. Well, yeah, well, I've since met her and asked her why she left her husband, and she told me that it was because he was being violent with her. So, you know, of course, the interviewer didn't want that perspective to be placed. And uh, and that's the issue that I have with the media is that there's very little, there's a lot of bias in the reporting, and you know Rick Ross has never visited any 
compound because I don't actually have one to visit. So, you know, his comments about whatever is meant to have been happening at a, at a compound that never existed and still does not, um, you know, it just indicates the lack of information that these people have about what is, what is really going on. My suggestion to any person is investigate what is really going on rather than trust what you hear from these people who are so-called experts. Right, right. I, re I remember in one of your lectures uh, that I saw, and I thought it was a very interesting one, one of the audience members asked you, how do, how do you know that you're Jesus? Mm -hmm. That was uh, on April 16th, 2011, that yeah. lecture. And you said something very interesting. You said you were, you were young and you had many memories of abuse and you blocked those memories out at age 12, mm -hmm. uh, like a sexual abuse victim, and those were your words. Uh, you later got married, you had two kids, your wife was chronically depressed, uh, you were nearing a breakdown, running four companies simultaneously, and you had to go home and live with your parents. And, and you said that you spent 18 months crying mm -hmm. and that you left the Jehovah's Witness, you were ostracized, from them, um, your parents and your old church all treated you like you were dead, and you were suicidal for four months. You basically didn't have anybody, and you contemplated killing yourself. So you went to a therapist for three months, and then you switched to another therapist, then another therapist for a year. You were still living with your parents, and you said you were crying for the first three hours of every day. So a lot of emotional turmoil, yeah. and your, your sons didn't want to see you anymore, and then you continuously cried, cried for three three more months, and, and then you started having memories of torture, abuse, rape, and childhood. Oh, I'd had those memories before then, but yes, I started recognizing those right. memories, yeah. Right. I'm, I'm almost done here. It's from your lecture. Yeah. Uh, you said you cried every day for seven years. You left therapy and went to see a medium, and after you saw her, you went and cried some more. You went on the internet, and then you, you came upon some books, and, and then you decided that the abuse and rape that you'd been tormented by for so many years was because you were Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Um, AJ, do you, do you ever wonder, and I, I, I honestly don't say this. Can I say that I didn't talk, I didn't say I'm being raped. I said, I said that um, the abuse was like shutting, like a rape victim shuts down the memory of anything that occurs. It's exactly the same ha that happens with any violent trauma. But, but go on. Okay. Yep. Okay, so, so my question to you, and this in all sincerity is not yeah. an attack, but yeah. do, you, do you ever think that, that maybe you are suffering from, from a mental illness and that you might need treatment and that, that you might be a little bit misdirected in your own brain with all of this suffering and, and the claims that, that you're Jesus? Well, my suggestion to any person who makes such a claim about me is to spend a bit of time with me if you want and see and see that for yourself. Like, I don't believe I am, but, you know, I can also state that uh, there are many people on the planet who don't believe that they have some kind of mental illness. So um, the reality is I know that each person that I've ever met in the world has a huge amount of grief inside of them that they've yet to release, and they have to go through a process of releasing it, I believe. And that's what I chose to do. Absolutely. Mm. I'm not saying that it's an attack, but you know, my part of what interests me in my job is to understand people and to, to get to the bottom of, of their thoughts and, and what they're going through and their mm. experience. Mm -hmm. And and to not put that question out there, you understand would be would be not doing my job. Well, yes, but see, uh, again, Chris, uh, the fact that I've actually stated my history very, very clearly so that you could dream it off like in the way that you actually have is an indication of my transparency and my openness. Now, instead of, instead of going, wow, that's pretty amazing that someone would talk about all of that publicly, answering questions of people, and uh, you're now focusing down a different track, which is, which is uh, you know, uh, perhaps I am still sort of sick mentally or something like that. Every single person who interacts with me in my day-to-day -day life does not believe that I am sick mentally. Um, so you're thinking, so, you're thinking of that. Attack. And it is not an attack. It's, it's a sincere question. Everybody in this world has their own process to bear, no pun intended. Everybody has their own struggles and mm -hmm. their own difficulties. So it's but, but Chris, but Chris uh, like I understand the question. That's why I answered the question through that particular presentation. Does that make sense? Like I, I've already answered all of these questions. You, you're just reading out everything that I've already answered and put in on the public record. And this is for the, but this is for the American public. This is yeah, 
Los Angeles right now. Which yeah, is but, but the reality is that any single person can go to that video and, and listen to everything that I've said about my life and then make their own assessment, which is the reason why I've done it the way I have. Um, Absolutely. Now they can easily understand you. I mean, this is just information that you've put out there. This isn't an attack. And I, I don't that's correct. That's correct. And the reason why I put the information out there is so that people can be totally informed and therefore make up their own personal opinion rather than being guided by some third party that has no idea. No, no, yeah. this, isn't, this isn't guiding, AJ. This is, this is putting out your words and your information and it's asking you a straight up question. Yes. And my suggestion... My suggestion is that it, rather than me giving a two-minute soundbite for you, any person who wants to know my history can go to that video that you've just quoted and listen to my entire discussion of that history, and, and you're questioning whether I believe that I'm sane or not, and I feel I'm completely sane. Now, that's up to people to assess themselves, I believe. Okay. Hmm. But but for yourself, you, you would never, and because you're you're a very introspective fellow, that that's obvious, and you're obviously very intelligent. Have you never questioned question that? Question whether I'm sane. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> I've certainly questioned whether I'm sane. That's why you know I had to go through all of those emotions to to come to the conclusion that I've currently come to. Yeah, so I, I don't I don't see any issue with that. I think the average person on the planet who came to it at the point of feeling that they were Jesus, they need to go through questioning whether they are sane or not, just like I had to. Absolutely. So, <laughs> yeah, it, was a, it was a valid question. Yeah, definitely a valid question. That's why I've answered a lot of it in the videos, you know. Right, for mm. sure. But, mm. but you understand a lot of our listeners have never even heard of you, let alone your videos. Of course. Like, There's a lot of media who sort of believe that I sort of woke up one morning believing on Jesus and, and, and that it was a nice, simple sort of a process and that everything after that, I, I just arrogantly assumed that I was Jesus. That's definitely not what's actually happened to me. And I've answered that question so many times with regard to people's questioning of me. And I feel there's so much information now available on the net about about my personal life and a lot of that information of course is false but the stuff that I've personally put there is a statement of my own record of what's happened and uh, and I believe any person I, I'm being totally transparent I believe any person can see that and I'm perfectly happy for people to have their own assessments about that so I've been called a lot of, a lot of names as a result of my doing that but I believe that that's a part of me just being transparent and honest about uh, what's happened to me. Absolutely. Mm. But I, I don't want you to feel that uh, we misrepresented you because we... You no, know, I don't believe you've misrepresented me. Uh, Chris, I feel that I've represented myself quite <laughs> quite a lot in terms of what's on the videos. And, and I feel that any sincere person who wants to find out my character or nature has 700 hours worth of videos where I'm open and transparent to look at to make their own personal assessment, you know? You can find those on YouTube under AJ Miller or The Divine Truth, correct? Yeah, The Divine Truth channel on YouTube um, has all of those videos present and we just keep putting more and more on. Myself and Mary do that. We're both very, very open with our life and and we're both very, very open about our progression as well. Like, you, you, If you look at the older videos compared to the new ones, you will see that we've changed as well. Right. Hmm. Uh, we just got a few more minutes here. I just can I ask you a couple more questions, sure, Rachel? Sure. Uh, what, what did you think about the Matt Siegel uh, interview? That uh, Matt Siegel was the correspondent for the New York Times. He interviewed you not too long ago. Yep. Um, you were unhappy with that, I understand. Uh, I was only unhappy with the, with Matt's uh, condescension and treatment of me during the interview in my own home. And and the reality is, I feel that a person can respectfully interview somebody without resorting to condescension and also without, without you know a person who's interviewing needs to listen to the answer rather than just promote their own question like I feel a lot of the media take the pro approach that they've already decided about what they want to present and whenever you give an answer that's not in line with what they want to present they just either ignore that answer and move on 
or uh, you know, or, or contradict the answer themselves. And to me, a lot of the times they're not actually doing an interview; they're actually making a heap of statements that they want you to either agree or disagree with. And th to me, that's not an interview. That's just a. They might as well just write an opinion piece about me. Right. Yeah. I, re I remember he said that uh, because he, the two of you were discussing uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, he was asking you, why don't you just fly there and show them how to do mining in a non-destructive way mm -hmm. because you said you know how to do that mm -hmm. and you responded that you wouldn't do that because the people there don't want to learn non-destructive mining techniques. Yeah, the companies that run the mining industry generally don't want to learn non-destructive techniques at this point in time. I think a lot of them would like to investigate it but they certainly don't want to hear from a person who's claiming to be Jesus um, at, at this point in time. So, you know, if a person wants to hear from me, I will speak to them quite fine. But if a person doesn't want to speak, hear from me, then I'm not going to bash down their door and try to make them listen to me. Have you, have you ever had doctors, because I know you, you're not, you don't seem very uh, on board with the whole psychiatric uh, uh, frame of reference. Have you ever had doctors that angered you or, or kind of uh, slammed no. you, do you feel? No, um, I think a lot, of, a lot of doctors have their own personal assessment of a situation. And, you know, I, I believe a lot of the times that they are correct. As a, and then a lot of times they can be incorrect. Um, I have many psychiatrists, psychologists and doctors come to my presentations. And most of them that meet me don't believe that I'm crazy or, or sick or anything like that and um, but I do believe there is like I do feel that in every single profession on this planet there needs to be much more harmony with love and and I feel that the medical profession while it is quite a loving profession still can make changes to become even more so Right. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to say, and I want I want to know what you think of this. I spoke to uh, just in preparation in preparation for this interview. I spoke to uh, a renowned psychiatrist who saw a lot of your videos, and uh, he suggested that uh, that I suggest to you that perhaps you suffer from NPD. Do you know what NPD is? Multiple personality disorder. Is that what he's suggesting? No, no. I no. suggest he was uh -huh. uh, narcissistic personality disorder. Oh, NPD. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, this has been said to me many times um, and uh, I find it sometimes amusing because any person who lives with me in my day-to-day -day life knows that I'm definitely not narcissistic. In fact, I have very little, uh, you know, very little desire to, um, to have anybody worship me or any of those kind of things. I think a lot of the times these assessments are based upon people's own personal beliefs about what Jesus should be and also personal beliefs about what I must be claiming if I'm claiming to be Jesus. And, sure. and I, feel, I feel that I feel, my beliefs about myself are that I'm just a normal person. This has always been my belief even for the last 2,000 years, that I'm a normal person who, is, who, who discovered through a process that God took me through a way to connect to God, to become at one with God. And I believe any other person on the planet can can discover and engage this exactly the same process in order to become Christed. And, and so I don't have a feeling or opinion that I'm any greater or better than any other person on this planet. Right, exactly. And, then, and you, you sort of indicated that as well. Uh, just some of the, the point forms he, he sent was uh, a person with NPD is pre preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, or brilliance, uh, believes that he or she is special and unique. Yeah, I don't have any of those beliefs at all. <laughs> Uh, lacks empathy and shows arrogant, haughty behavior. Yeah, well, everybody who meets me feels that I'm empathetic to their particular problems and issues. Right, yeah. right. So well, there you go. I don't have any of those particular traits at all. In there. And this is the problem with uh, psychiatric evaluation by a third, you know, by a third party without even meeting a person. I think even people in the psychiatric profession would question. Yeah, I don't know why he said it. It was probably because you said you're Jesus. 
something. Yeah, exactly. As soon as, soon as I say I'm Jesus, people make a, a, a large number of assumptions, none of which I am personally claiming. Uh, the price. Mm. Assumptions? Oh, it's not surprising, no, given how long these assumptions have been present on the planet. Like, I understand why people make the assumptions. And and also, I understand that many of the other people who claim to be Jesus uh, do fit those particular profiles. I'm just suggesting to you that I do not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're different than mm. them. That's great. Yeah, AJ Miller, aka Jesus, joining us from Australia, and uh, we are live in Los Angeles. Thanks, AJ. Have a great night. Thank you, Chris. Bye bye. Bye bye.